good evening everyone i once again thank overman foundation for giving me this opportunity of uh, delivering something on sr windows the future poetry so we have been discussing the general course and movement of english poetry uh, its unique terms and reversals influences of other nations and its own inherent genius and power so to continue our discussion we see there's a point in the course of this poetry its downward curve where it reaches the very low levels of the dry and brazen intellectualism uh it's um evidently a stage of decadence with uh, shutting down off and losing the greater powers the vitality uh, the creative energy and flexibility of expression so by and by comes about a decay a downfall and this kind of descent has occurred several times in literary history siorbindo says and these phases are even necessary to some extent uh, because it's the way of nature there has to be the descent for the next rise uh, there must be the emptyings before fresh and new ideas and forms can be filled in so these falls are the conditions the price the literary age has to pay for future elevations these are the prefaces to large inrushes of plenty as sri aurobindo says and from this descent and fall after the movement has reached an all time low comes the saving grace the revival the revulsion which is a return of life this can be brought about either by external forces uh the shock from without or by a liberating impulse from within so this saving revulsion as sri aurobindo terms it compensates for the decadence for the fall by a steep ascent bringing in new revealing visions and illumined motives uh for the uh, movement of the next phase of poetic creation <coughs> but <coughs> it's um not all that are fully advantageous even these revulsions and revolutions have their own drawbacks the void <clears throat> that is created in the past descent uh, sometimes is filled with an inrush of energy and light which may be too premature and along with it if there is this element of quick unripeness then the way is paved for another decadence another return to lower levels So English poetry has gone through all these phases, and in its next course of a swift and far-reaching upward curve, all these characteristic phenomena are visible. So this is the course and character of English poetry in its journey to the luminous outbreak of joy and beauty and sight and creative impulse from the age of thin pseudo classicism with its intellectual superficialities. And in England, this is the second outburst of this kind in literature. so the previous age uh, that we were talking about that is uh, the 18th century was dominantly intellectual as we have seen but uh, the dry hard intellect alone is not sufficient for any valuable or great uh, poetic creation reason and intelligence are useful no doubt but they are not the highest faculties of man the intellectual tendency and motive are not enough to build up a great culture uh, that is religion art and poetry contribute in a huge way towards giving values to culture and tradition a poet or an artist cannot create by intellect alone his creative impetus is not provided solely by reason and judgment the inspiration to create is needed and intuitive seeing and an inspired hearing are the native and natural resources of the poet and one may neglect these at one's own peril sri arbindo says uh, intuition and inspiration are spiritual in their essence and it is due to these that spiritual vision and utterance come and when intuition and inspiration become part of the poetic process then uh, the poetry gets a deeper and more luminous force even when dealing with themes of external life and uh, inspiration also sublimates the surface movements of emotion and passion 
Sometimes thoughts are more empowered when intuition and inspiration are at work and uh, poetic truths are uttered. Truths which give the inner and outer life of both the creator and hearer a greater and deeper meaning. So uh, let's uh, consider some lines from uh, one of Sri Aurobindo's own poems. Um, it's a, a sort of what we can say experiential uh, poetry where he's writing and this is something which he has experienced. Vast, God-possessing, embraced by the wonderful, lifted by the all-beautiful into his infinite beauty. Love shall envelop the endless and fathomless. Joy unimaginable, ecstasy illimitable, light without darkness, truth that is dateless. So um, this comes from experience. So uh, Sri Aurobindo had written elsewhere that all great artistic work proceeded from intuition. So there needs to be some truth and some significant form of that truth is revealed in words. The intellect and imagination alone work to produce only, they can give only mental translations of the truth. And Sri Aurobindo uh, has also said that ancient Indian art was intuitive and spiritual because it could reveal something of the divine, something of the infinite. Okay, so uh, to turn to English poetry again, uh, in its fourth phase of evolution, uh, we can see the effect of the higher light upon the poetic intelligence of the creators. But this is very faint though in the beginning. This was what some ancient mystics probably worked with. They were guided by it. And uh, we can know this in and through their myths and the symbols they used in their poetry. In um, English poetry, however, this phase is the first one where poets attempt to go beyond the level of the intellect and try to fathom the unseen and the unknown. Their striving is after the hidden and ideal truths which lie veiled behind the surface mind and unreachable by the ordinary intellect. Uh, Sri Aurobindo is here talking about a transitional phase, uh, a departure from an earlier type in uh, English poetry. And he says that though Milton and other poets of his age gave into the temper of intellectualism, yet their endeavor in these lines was not adequate either in range or subtlety. And this is true of Milton himself. And those who came after him showed even lesser depth of this note of intellectualism. A richer, deeper, wider intellectual humanism could have been expected a new endeavor in this field, which could have aimed at a poetic, artistic, many-sided intellectualism. In fact, um, the mainstream European culture went along such lines in those days. In England too, this kind of movement was seen in the 19th century. That is a kind of uh, what Sri Aurobindo calls an uh, indistinct and half-conscious drift. It was a slow, transitional movement which occupied the stage of English poetry between the 18th century, that is the age of Pope, and that of Wordsworth, the Romantic Age in the 19th century. But this did not develop into any strong form. It was poor and faltering and its influence lingered in the poetic arena for a while only. And the tendencies of this uh, transitional age uh, got reflected in not more than five or six poets like, say, Thompson, Gray, Goldsmith, Cowper, Burns. So <clears throat> this first flush of romanticism after the age of artificial style and manners may well be taken as a kind of liberalism where the poet turns to his faculty of imagination and relies on that more than the common sense. So it spelled the freedom of the poetic spirit from the fetters of the past age with the poet's return to nature and the common man. And the individual genius here once again came to the fore. So um, I just quote uh, some lines um, from a one very characteristic poem of the Romantic Revival. 
The Seasons by James Thompson, where he writes, Come, gentle spring, ethereal mildness, come, and from the bosom of your drooping cloud, while music wakes around, veiled in a shower of shadowing roses on our plains descend. So this is uh, from the part called uh, Spring. And notice how it recalls uh, the Elizabethan style. However, other greater forces replaced this and the emergence of a Celtic turn of the national mind at this time took the poets in its sudden grip and they were carried beyond themselves, beyond mere intellect and drawn towards supra-intellectual sources of inspiration. And even here, this uh, greater force was short-lived because, uh, first of all, there was great lack of spiritual knowledge, which could adequately make use of and work with these greater tendencies. Also, it could not be put to the right and native word of their own meaning. No suitable and appropriate language was yet ready for these supra-intellectual themes. Moreover, um, the poets of the era were unable to give proper form and supreme utterance to things beyond the intellect. So this tendency faded away. And uh, yet it did not altogether disappear, but left its faint traces and paved the way for the next new world of poetry to emerge. And this was the dawn only of this new poetry followed by the noon of the age of the great romantics, Wordsworth, Keats, Shelley, Blake. So these poets came with a new breath of air and gave to English poetry a new direction and a new world, unlike that of the ancients and different even from their immediate predecessors. And Sri Aurobindo says, these first explorers created what may be the familiar realm of the aesthetic faculty in the future. So we shall take up the great romantic poets and their poetry in greater detail in our future discussions. For the time being, let us try to analyze what were the factors and motives which led to the creation of this new kind of poetry. Sri Aurobindo says early signs of this coming new age were already visible in the poetry of the mid 18th century. So uh, <clears throat> that must uh, include the works of poets like Gray, Collins, Thompson, Cowper and others, as we have mentioned. And in these works, <clears throat> we already find the first attempts to break away from the artificialities of the poetic mold to which the poets of the earlier age had subjected themselves to. Now, <clears throat> poets like Gray, Collins, Cowper, these, uh, they chose their own freedom from the rigidity of the metrical and rhetorical style. They widened the horizons of the earlier limited subject matter of poetry and more importantly, brought into force once more the faculty of imagination and vision, which the earlier intellectual uh, era of poets had almost discarded under the banner of the pseudo-classical cult. <clears throat> Instead, these poets returned to the Miltonic blank verse, which itself was a liberation from the fixed and formal metrical mold, as also the Spenserian form which they tried to imitate. And this influence is seen later in Byron, Keats and Shelley also. So the pre-romantics also sought liberation in composing in different forms like the ode or other freer molds giving and allowing freer lyrical movements to their verse. So let us look at some compositions of uh, these precursors of romanticism. So I'm quoting here uh, uh, some lines from a very well-known poem, Elegy written in a country churchyard, where the poet writes, The curfew tolls the knell of parting day, the lowing herd winds slowly over the lea. The ploughman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me. Now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight and all the air a solemn stillness holds, save where the beetle wheels his droning flight and drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds. 
So see, in spite of its melancholic mood, it ushers in a new kind of poetry, a new mode, as we also see in these lines from Goldsmith's very popular poem, The Deserted Village, uh, where he's writing, <clears throat> In all my wanderings round this world of care, in all my griefs, and God has given my share, I still had hopes my latest hours to crown amidst these humble bowers to lay me down, to husband out life's taper at the close, and keep the flame from wasting my repose. And uh, the rest of the poem, it continues in much the same vein, with its unique fusion of many emotions. So let me read more from poems of the Romantic Idealism, and this time these are from uh, James Thompson's very remarkable poem, The Castle of Indolence, where he writes, Full in the passage of the veil above, a sable, silent, solemn forest stood, where naught but shadowy forms was seen to move as idleness fancied in her dreaming mood. So these were the um, kind of poems that were being written in those times. Uh, and there were also attempts to recover something of the Shakespearean language as also the pre-restoration softer tones. And this they tried to modify in a way to make their poetry a vehicle of the intellectualized treatment of thought and life. And Sri Aurobindo says that this was because this kind of an intellectualized treatment and speech had now become indispensable. Though imagination had its role, yet the intellectual element could not be got rid of absolutely. It had become a fixed need and was reflected in the language of poetry here. So this was some remnant of the earlier age, which uh, attached itself as a tag even in the Romanticism, though of beginners. So what we have in this age basically is the first flush of the Romantic hue in the poetic themes and their treatment, but not quite in spirit, which of course was to come later. Yet this must be reckoned as a new power in English poetic speech when the poet and the poetic imagination attempts to look directly upon life and nature. For instance, listen to this expounding of the theme of the relation and response of man to nature. As simmer rains bring simmer flowers and leaves do plead the birkin bowers. So beauty gets by color showers, so rich a bloom. As for estate or heavy dowers, act stands in room. These are from the 18th century uh, poem, uh, Color Water by Ferguson. And we can notice the natural ease with which the lines are composed. But this is as yet the poetry of sentiment and uh, not <clears throat> that high inspired voice of feeling and passion. What held back the poets from indulging into sheer inspired passionate speech was perhaps the lingering influence of the past intellectual tradition. Thus, this new motive, though powerful in a way, remained incipient because of the lack of free, unhindered expression. As say these lines from the didactic poem, um, that is Cowper's The Task Displays. Here yeah, are just a few lines. The very elements, though each be meant the minister of man to serve his wants, conspire against him. With his breath, he draws a plague into his blood and cannot use life's necessary means, but he must die. So see how heavily rhetorical is this in its language. So what is missing is intensity of poetic emotion in the hard and external verse form. Um, uh, though they were keen on lyrical composition, the proper lyrical note is not found in the works of these poets. Even the odes display rhetorical stateliness. This form, this, uh, the form of the ode was uh, to be lyricized in the poetry of Keats and Shelley later on. So much of the new spirit and motive was of the outer technique only, and it was yet quite a while before the true and proper spirit of Romanticism would seize the poetic intelligence of English poets. 
for in this pre-romantic uh, or the pre-romantic poets, uh, the romanticism is more of the intellect than is there in their temperament. So let us take a look at some lines from the ode by Collins. Uh, it's called Ode to Evening. And he's writing, uh, in a kind of a vein of romanticism, we can read this. Now air is hushed, save where the weak-eyed bat, with short, shrill shriek, flits by on leathern wing. Or where the beetle winds his small but sullen horn, as oft he rises midst the twilight path, against the pilgrim bone in heedless hum. Now teach me, maid composed, to breathe some softened strain, whose numbers stealing through thy darkening veil may not unseemly with its stillness suit, as musing slow I hail thy genial love's return. So um, the heavy weight of intellectualism actually weakens the sentiments. As yet, there's less of vision and emotion and no seeing into the life of things. And as Riorbindo says, the swift uplifting was still to be. So all these tendencies and characteristics go to form the thin tricklings which grow and widen into the mighty stream of later modern poetry. And one poet who best represents this age and in whom the newborn spirits break free of their imprisonment and find a free flow in his verses is none other than Robert Burns, who is the noted songwriter among English poets. He has acquired in his poetic speech, even in simple, straightforward speech, a sort of freedom, a varied movement. Though a bit intellectualized sometimes for pure lyrical emotion, yet the intrinsic merits of his poetry are more than his limitations. So his is almost a solitary voice in lyric poetry of this age, uh, which at times reaches high intensities and gives the suggestion of the subtle and the profound. So Burns poetry stirs and moves us. As say in lines like these, um, and I've picked at random uh, some lines from Afton Water, where Burns is writing in his characteristic melodious way. Flow gently, sweet Afton, among thy green ways. Flow gently, I'll sing thee a song in thy praise. My Mary's asleep by thy murmuring stream. Flow gently, sweet Afton, disturb not her dream. How lofty, sweet Afton, thy neighboring hills, far marked with the courses of clear winding rills. There daily I wander as noon rises high, my flocks and my Mary's sweet cot in my eye. How pleasant thy banks and green valleys below, where wild in the woodlands the primroses blow. There oft as mild evening weeps over the lea, the sweet-scented burk shades my Mary and me. So Robert Burns, the lover, the poet, is a poet of love. And all those who love poetry, love reading poetry for his own sake, please do go to Burns and especially the generation of young lovers. Go to Burns, fall in tune with his melody. So however, the, there are many merits of his verse. And Sri Aurobindo says, which uh, are characteristic of modern poetry. And in Sri Aurobindo's own words, these are clear reflective thought, a new naturalness, closely observing eye, the stirring force of great general ideas, a spirit of revolt and self-assertion, a free play of individuality and violent sentiment. Uh, these are some characteristics of Burns' poetry uh, as we find in his very popular works like uh, Tam O'Shanter, uh, Coming Through the Rye, Halloween, or uh, say the Cotter's Saturday Night. So uh, let me read out uh, uh, from him just to get an idea of how all these characteristics are exemplified and projected in his verses. Uh, so I've chosen um, a very lyrical poem by uh, Burns and um, that is called a very romantic name it, it has a font kiss 
and some of whose lines are also very popular where he's writing a fond kiss and then be severe a farewell and then forever deep in heart wrung tears i'll pledge thee warring sighs and groans i'll wage thee who shall say the fortune grieves him while the star of hope she leaves him but to see her was to love her love but her and love for ever had we never loved so kindly had we never loved so blindly never met or never parted we had never been broken hearted so uh, with robert once i can go on and on so i need to check myself here it's so melodious is his verse so in all the traits and tendencies that we have mentioned here burns poetry comes to us as strong fresh creations but he is only the initiator for newer motives uh, burns is according to sri arvindo the forerunner of the great romantics in whose hands we get the final and finished products of the crude beginnings that we see in burns and of these future master singers as sri arvindo calls them william wordsworth comes first the romantic poetry proper in england has six voices and sri arvindo makes them into three pairs as they that is uh, both poets of a pair have something in common in spite of differences and here are sri arvindo's categories of english romantic poets um, wordsworth and byron form a pair Blake and Coleridge another, and then we have the pair of Shelley and Keats. Of these, in Byron's poems, we may still hear echoes of past intellectualism sometimes. He does go beyond it, of course, but does not enter the spiritual realm proper. In Wordsworth, we see a more vehement break from the past. Uh, we have stronger motives, newer motives. but somewhere the lingering force of narrow intellectualism touches and pulls down his poetry too and his poetic capabilities from the heights and for those who have read blake and coleridge will unhesitatingly agree with sri aurobindo's views that these two great english poets have opened for us magical gates singing of the beyond the mystical the supernatural and sri aurobindo says their voices ring with an unearthly melody so in our next talks we shall certainly listen to these poets uh, as we shall do to other romantic poets also with our keener awakening so that we may comprehend better their message in a poet like shelley the idealism and spiritual motives reached great heights and he was mostly unintelligible to the common people of his days now shelley is returning to us with his poetry and its message uh, uh, but uh, remember this was uttered 100 years ago and today also we can see the same of most of these poets keats the youngest of the great six sings of the ideal beauty yet his is not the profound voice of the mystic So, with this very very brief introduction, uh, Sri Aurobindo actually arouses our greater desire and interest in the poetry of the Romantic age, and we shall deal with it in uh, elaborate detail in our next discussions. And yet, it won't be so very lengthy because this new creative impulse meets with a sudden demise. This spiritual seeking. this groping for the beyond comes to an abrupt stop with the english poetic spirit turning again towards the senses with which to grasp poetic truth and seek pleasure intellectualism once more comes to play its role on the stage but this time it is an artistic or finely psychologizing intellectualism as sri aurobindo says and evidently we are talking of the uh, age the literary age which followed the romantic age that is the victorian period in english literature but before that before we go to 
the Victorian poets. We shall listen to our romantic singers and their magical melodies who make us see life and things and into the life of things. Thank you so much.